Welcome to episode 226 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Roland Rod Swanson, who served in the FBI for 20 years. On October 1st, 2017, in what was the largest mass shooting incident in U.S. history, 58 concert goers were killed. An additional 422 people were shot, two who later died, and more than 800 people were injured at the Route 91 Harvest Festival in Las Vegas, Nevada. In this episode, Rod Swanson reviews how, although retired, he used his FBI experience and training to assist FBI victim services personnel with the recovery, identification, and return of personal items left behind by victims of the Las Vegas mass shooting. He shares his initial frustration when he realized that his retirement status meant he could not participate in the investigation of this major crisis event. The exact type of crisis event that he had prepared for during his bureau career. A career that began with his first assignment to the Philadelphia Division, where he worked on the Violent Crimes Fugitive Task Force was a relief supervisor, a SWAT team operator, and a firearms instructor. He was next selected to become a member of Director Mueller's protective detail and then served as an international terrorism operations supervisor at FBI headquarters. He was later promoted to supervise the Transnational Criminal Enterprise Squad and the Joint Terrorism Task Force in the Las Vegas field office. He was also assigned as a deputy on-scene commander in Baghdad and as the legal attache in Yemen. Upon his return to the U.S. and the Las Vegas Division, Rod was placed on a public corruption squad. After his retirement from the FBI, he served for five years as the chief of investigations for the Nevada Office of the Attorney General. Currently, Rod is the owner and lead consultant at RDS Consulting LLC, where he advises corporate security officers on continuity risk, crisis management, threat evaluation and mitigation, and executive protection. Rod can be reached via his LinkedIn profile. Now, this episode is a little different. It's not focused on a case investigated by Rod during his career, but on an event that occurred after his retirement, where he found himself on the sidelines, totally out of the loop, and how he found a way to contribute nonetheless. It's a great story. There is speculation that the mass shooter's motivation was notoriety. During this interview, the mass shooter's name will not be mentioned, nor will it be in the show notes. Now, before we get to the interview... I want to thank everyone who went out and purchased a copy of my FBI word search puzzle book. I had mentioned to you that a major puzzle publisher, say that fast three times, had decided to create their own FBI word search puzzle book. Now, sometimes competition is good, but I anticipate that this is going to definitely affect my sales. So I want to thank those of you who went right out and picked up a copy. As a matter of fact, I want to thank everyone who continues to purchase my books, nonfiction and crime fiction about the FBI. My goal is to continue to turn advertisers away as long as you continue to support the show by picking up copies of my books which are available as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks wherever books are sold. There's a link with more information about my books in your podcast app's description of this episode. 
I also want to welcome new listeners and invite all of you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV and movies. Reader team members also get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 60 books about the FBI written by agents who have been guests on FBI Retired Case File Review. There's also a link to join my reader team and your podcast app's description of this episode. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Rod Swanson. Hey, Rod, how are you? Hi, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Well, I can confess to everyone that we spent probably a good 15, 20 minutes catching up with each other because we were both in the Philadelphia division for several years at the same time. And we have so many friends and former colleagues in common. So that was nice catching up. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. I mean, what great number of years in in my career and my life. I love being there. Yeah, Philadelphia is a great place. Now, the reason that I reached out to you to come on the show to talk about this event was because you wrote an article on LinkedIn about it. You know, I've already read your bio, you know, before the interview started, but here is somebody who had been an infantry officer in the Army. You had worked 20 years with the FBI, working violent crimes and international terrorism. You were a deputy on-scene commander and had had assignments in Baghdad and, you know, Iraq. And you were a legat in Yemen and worked in Ethiopia. So, you know, you had all of this experience and training. But the event that I imagine has had the biggest impact on your life actually occurred after you retired. Yes, that's right. The it's basically a situation where, you know, you train all your life because at some point that critical event is going to occur, especially in today's today's environment. Threats are coming from international terrorism lanes. They're coming from domestic terrorism lanes, as well as other criminal threats. And, you know, the intent that someone has to to do harm. And people who have been in the terrorism world, you know, understand this. The biggest fear that any of us probably ever had was, what about that lone offender. What about that guy that flies completely under the radar and does harm? Running the Joint Terrorism Task Force here in Nevada for years, I I don't know how many times I asked myself, when is it going to be Las Vegas' turn? What is Las Vegas' turn going to look like? Because Las Vegas is one of those targets that has been on the mind in terrorists wanting to inflict damage in the West. And it wasn't a matter of if it would happen. It was more of a matter of when it would happen. And it happened on 1 October 2017. It involved someone who flew completely under law enforcement's radar, had not committed any criminal activity was not involved in a group or any kind of online or more formalized radicalization process. He truly was someone who, I think in the end, you know, the investigation probably proved that he was one of those true lone offenders that was not radicalized and was more of a domestic threat than than anything else. But that night on 1 October 2017, the Route 91 Harvest Festival was going on here in Las Vegas. That's a big country music concert, a series of concerts that occur through that weekend. Some of them were indoors, but on October 1, the concert venue was outside. It was literally across the street from Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino. The uh, concerts had been going on for hours, multiple Multiple artists uh, were performing. The main event was going on. And at the time when the shooting started, I guess Jason Aldean was, was the artist that was performing. One of the things that was interesting about this night, you know, one, and I'll set the stage on this. One, I had retired from the FBI 25 months 
prior to this incident. I, at the time, I was the chief of investigations with the Nevada Attorney General's office. I had been in in that role since September of 2015. I was still an FBI TFO. I was a participant on the JTTF executive board and I had uh, state investigators that served on FBI led task forces across the state. No, we're always throwing out acronyms on this show. Uh, I just want to make sure that listeners know that a TFO is a task force officer. Yes. So my uh, security clearance and relationships with the FBI all across Nevada, you know, were long term and in place for many, many years and continued well after uh, my retirement from the FBI. And the night of this incident, for whatever reason, I had gone to bed early. I was I was asleep, you know, probably before 10 o'clock that night or around 10 o'clock that night. And shortly after 10 p.m. on 1 October 2017, the shooting started. The subject, I don't even necessarily want to use his name. I'll tell you what his name is if you need it. But he had literally spent days barricading himself on the 22nd night floor, a very high level floor at Mandalay Bay. They gave him a field of fire across the concert venue location across the street. By the time the shooting started, 58 concert goers were dead. 422 concert attendees and others on the street were shot and more than 800 people were ultimately hurt, you know, during that incident. And that incident has, to the best of my knowledge anyway, has become known as the largest mass shooting in U.S. history. So as I mentioned, the night of the shooting, I'd gone to bed early. My phone rang about 1230 in the morning. The Nevada attorney general was on the other line and he said, are you watching the news? And, you know, I was trying to wake up to talk to him and I told him, no, let me watch the news and I'll, I'll call you back. And I was blown away at what I saw in the news. Here I was listening to the most awful event that critical incident, mass shooting, mass casualty type incident in Las Vegas, in my city, and I'm at home in bed. I called my boss back and he happened to be in Las Vegas. Normally he was in Northern Nevada, but I knew where he was at his hotel. And I said, look, I'll be there in 30 minutes to pick you up. We're going to the command post that I know is going to be up and running at Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And that's exactly what we did. So, you know, by 1.30 in the morning, we were there at the command post. The whole situation was extremely chaotic. No one from the bureau was there at that point. We were talking to the sheriff who I've known for many years and have a very good relationship with him. And he was very appreciative of us being there and offering to help. You know, to give you a sense of what the crime scene looked like, you know, it was an outdoor concert venue. It was approximately 15 acres in size. You know, there were 22,000 people at this event when the uh, shooting started. So you can imagine that, you know, once the shooting started, People were trying to get out. They dropped everything that they had. They literally were running for their lives. Fortunately, most people got out. Many did not. So picture, you know, those of us in the FBI or in law enforcement can sort of envision, I think, just the, the enormity of what this crime scene looked like. 22 acres is a lot. Out here, lots are small, housing lots are small. So there's probably 48 homes built in that space. Going to the command post, when the command post wasn't even fully operational at that point, I was just chomping at the bit because in my, in my experience in the FBI, you know, I was a trained and certified crisis manager. I ran command posts for the Las Vegas division. I don't know how many times. I don't know how many New Year's Eve celebrations and and special events. You know, I was in charge of resourcing the command post, resourcing the forward command post at various venues. This concert was not considered to be a quote unquote special event. So I, I was just, Hey, sheriff. And, you know, the SAC and one of the ASACs showed up and 
you know, they knew me and had known me for years. How can I help? I've got 50 sworn investigators. I can go to the, I can start going to the hospitals and I can start interviewing victims and witnesses that are in a position to talk. I can use my resources and start tracking down people who've submitted video. I can, or people who have called the tip line, you know, to provide information on the, on the shooting. Give me a mission, you know, let me help. Let me use my resources to help bring this to resolution. You know, I knew, you know, at the time that this was happening and I'm offering my resources that this whole incident was outside of my jurisdiction. And quite frankly, that thought blew me away. As I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of experience internationally and domestic in terrorism matters. Doesn't matter if it's international or domestic. And I don't have any jurisdiction and I have no dog in this fight. It was, it was something that was frustrating. It was disappointing in, in a way that you're kidding me. I'm not, I'm not going to be helping resolve this whole thing from a criminal standpoint, you know, and if there's a prosecution down the road, just not, not my role. And so that thought, you know, was, was hard for me. And, you know, and I realized as the command post stood up and operations were being coordinated and, you know, life safety uh, issues were starting to wind down, at least from getting the wounded to medical facilities all, all around the city for treatment. I totally understood that this was the jurisdiction of the FBI and the police department. The FBI was the lead until they were certain that it was not a terrorism incident. That's pretty much probably standard operating procedure around the country. The police and the FBI weren't going to relinquish any of the investigative responsibilities that they were faced with. And I can totally appreciate that. You know, when I take a step back and think about how things have gone in my experience, you know, your jurisdiction is what it is. Your role is, is what it is. And for the first time in almost two and a half decades, you know, my role was not dealing with this incident. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the kind of despair of it all, I think maybe people who aren't in law enforcement, they may not understand it as much. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. You know, one of the interesting things is, you know, the FBI is sort of like a family, right? And, you know, you're in it, you're part of it, you know, you're part of a team and you're all in when you're dealing with things, you know, you have your daily relationships that allow you to be successful at what you're doing. When you retire and you move on to whatever your next uh, role in life is. And in my case, you know, being a chief of investigations for the state of Nevada, I'm not part of that family anymore. I have the relationships. I'm considered a colleague and a friend. I know that I'm trusted by the people that I'm dealing with, but I'm, I'm not part of it anymore. So I find you find yourself on the outside looking in. And this is something that everybody's going to face, you know, depending on what kind of work they do after the FBI. And am I talking about something that is, you know, super profound? I don't know that I am, but what I'm talking about is, is you're in the game for however many years and decades. And then all of a sudden you're out. That is a hard transition for some to follow. At least it was for me because I'm, I want to help. I mean, this is, this is what I was trained to do. And it's, it was very unsettling to realize and be put in that situation where, okay, so now I got to figure out a way to help and help in a, in a meaningful way. So initially you're just talking to the sheriff and members of the Las Vegas Police Department. When do you start encountering you know, people that you used to work with side by side from the FBI? So later on the night of the shooting, you know, they, I was there a few hours before they were, but they were also standing up at the man post at, at the field office. You know, the sheriff and I at the time had known each other for a dozen years. The SAC and the ASAC, I had known them for a number of years. I mean, one SAC was uh, new since I retired, 
but had a lot of dealings with him over the years. So he knew me and the ASAC that was there knew me well as, you know, also. And, you know, I mean, if you, the enormity of this whole thing is hard for people to imagine if you aren't in that moment. The life safety issues that are going on are just overwhelming. Every hospital in the Las Vegas Valley was completely overwhelmed. EMS is transporting people. Citizens are transporting victims. People are walking to medical care. It's just, I, I don't know how else to describe it. You know, it's, it's the, the, it was so chaotic that that chaos, you know, not, and not in a negative way because it's going to happen regardless, but it transferred over into the command post operations. You've got a whole bunch of leaders in one place trying to wrap their head around not only what's happened, the loss of life. There were police officers from Las Vegas Metro that were killed during this. And there's just totality of what they're trying to manage and deal with is, you know, it's almost overwhelming. But as the hours went by, things started becoming more and more, how do I want it, less chaotic or less and less chaotic. And people started focusing more on, on moving into the investigative phase of what had occurred. Because of my experience, you know, one of the things that, that I had used in another real world crisis period was victim services division that is, is deployed out of FBI headquarters. You know, they consist of trained staff that are spread across the country. They're trained in, in, you know, mental health areas and grief counseling, just providing resources to first responders, but more importantly, victims and witnesses of a traumatic event like that. And because I knew that I came to the conclusion, you know, fairly quickly that this is an area where I think I can help. I had been down to that crime scene as soon as the sun came up. It was very unsettling being at, at that location. And I started to see one of the huge issues that the city was going to face. Worst case scenario, you've got 22,000 victims that were just inside that, that venue. They dropped anything and everything that they had. There were purses, wallets, cell phones, souvenirs, lawn chairs, coolers. I mean, if you can imagine what anybody would bring to a venue like that, these 15 acres were strewn with it. There were vendor stands at one end of the concert venue. And many of these vendor stands were riddled with bullet holes. You know, so you had personal effects, you know, that were inside and in and around these vendor spaces. ERT deployed to Las Vegas. As soon as I got down to the actual crime scene as ERT was getting set up. It's another acronym. ERT is the evidence response team. It's a national crime scene processing entity deployed where needed by the FBI. So when I got down to the crime scene as ERT was really starting to get going forensically processing the scene, you know, who did I run into? I ran into Richard Marks, one of my squad mates from Philadelphia, a longtime friend. You know, he seems to be at all the big crime scenes that happen anywhere where the Bureau has a response. Immediately, obviously, our relationships and friendships were helpful. I told him why I was here. And, you know, he actually pointed me in the right direction to find the correct victim witness staff folks that were on scene there in Las Vegas and flowing in so I could start to figure out whether or not the role that I had envisioned for my staff and I, whether that would be a viable role. Well, I quickly learned that it was. Between the FBI, Las Vegas is a relatively small, you know, division. Las Vegas Metro is a fairly large police department, but neither the FBI or Metro had the resources to deal with the personal effects that were left behind at the crime scene. Based on my conversations with the ERT lead and the victim assistance lead, that was the role that I went back to the command post, talked to the SAC and the sheriff and said, here's what I can do for you. You don't have the resources to do this. This is much lower on your priority list at the moment. But, you know, if you allow me to do this, one, you won't have to do it. 
Two, I'm going to be able to get these personal effects to a place and organized in a way where family members and or victim witnesses themselves can actually come to what was stood up as being the Family Assistance Center in Las Vegas and recover their property. Some people even asked me, some of my staff asked me, you know, well, why is that such a big deal? And, you know, and I, I told them, I said, here, the 58 people died here. How many other people have been shot and seriously wounded and may or may not survive? There's phones, there's pictures, there's video, there's, there's personal information and wallets and purses that are the last, the last things that some family member may have of their loved one that didn't make it out of there. That's important stuff. That's part of the recovery process following a critical incident. It's part of the recovery and healing process that goes on in, in a city like this. Las Vegas is kind of a funny place. You know, it's, it's about 2.2 million, you know, people in uh, Clark County, which is Southern Nevada, but it's the, it's the biggest small town in America. It's amazing at how, you know, much of a relationship driven town this is. People expect law enforcement to, to uh, look out for the needs and the concerns of the citizens. Let me ask you something or, or, or have you explained something? You mentioned Richard Marks. Could you just briefly talk about Richard and the understanding of how important this is, how you got that from the work that he did. So Richard and I, I was on squad 10 in Philadelphia a little bit of time, maybe a year or two. I'm not sure before Richard showed up. Richard had a scientific crime scene sort of background. I think he was from Alabama when he joined the FBI. The years that we worked together processing crime scenes from bank robberies and armored car robberies and, and other, other incidents, Richard, that was his thing. He always gravitated towards that and took the lead in doing it. I mean, it got to the point where me and others were, our skills are eroded a lot because we weren't doing the latent, picking up the latent fingerprints and some of the other evidentiary things, because that's what Richard liked. When I remember when 9-11 happened, because of Richard's expertise, he was in short order deployed up to outside of New York. You know, forgive me, but I don't remember the name of the landfill across the river. Fresh Kills. Okay. From Manhattan. But Richard ran that operation for I don't know how many months and until that operation was done. I think that he was there and one of the main people in charge of it. And then over the years after I left Philadelphia, I would even see him at various other crime scenes that were on the news that were millions of miles away from where I w was at the time. And I think one of them was the nightclub shooting in, in Florida. Orlando, was it? Yeah, what yeah, the, it was Orlando. Okay, so there was a nightclub uh, and an active shooter situation. And I think I saw him on the news there. And, you know, and then when I went down to the crime scene here, you know, you can imagine how relieved I was to run right in. I went straight to the command post and knocked on the door. And he's the one that opened it and comes walking down the steps. You know, it was like we'd seen each other last week, too. And, you know, so one, I knew that he knew what was going on. Two, he knew how he could help guide me a little bit in a manner that would allow me and my resources to help out. And, you know, it was that trust factor and, and knowledge and relationship that he and I had built together over a number of years. It made part of what I was trying to do a lot easier. Even though Richard hasn't retired yet, you know, my plan is to contact headquarters and, and see if I can get him on the show before the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Yeah, I mean, what a what a great guy. I, I don't there probably can't be someone in the FBI with more experience and more competent in dealing with forensic evidentiary issues than Richard. And I hope you can uh, get him on because he will have some amazing stories, I'm sure. 
Yeah, so I did see him about two years ago. I was able to sneak down to the FBI Academy with the Philadelphia Citizens Academy, and Richard met us at the FBI laboratory to do a presentation. So there were lots of hugs going around there. He's a great guy. I just wanted to kind of set the scene as to why you knew that the personal effects of the victims were were so important, and your experience working as an evidence uh, response team member provided that significance to you? Well, even more so than my personal experience with crime scene evidence, it was more my exposure with victim assistance and the types of services and skills that they bring to a critical incident. And that's, that's where I saw the, the niche. You know, one of the things that, that occurred, ERT had gridded off 15 acres. And that's the only way a scene that was that vast, you know, could really be managed effectively. And as evidence response finished processing each grid zone, then I was able to flow in with my staff and begin the recovery and the cataloging and in some degree to a certain degree even had to decontaminate a number of items before we could even remove them from the crime scene so that brings me to me trying to deal with my staff and our role in helping with this incident so at the attorney general's office at the time you know i had a few people that you know, were supervisors or deputy chiefs that had spent a career in local or state law enforcement. They had had some experience with critical incidents and, and bad crime scenes, but that was not anywhere near the majority of my staff. Most of the investigators that were assigned to me and some of the support folks that helped as well, they had never experienced anything as violent and horrific as the aftermath of this of this mass shooting. And as you can imagine, it was very unsettling to them. You know, so it was it was up to me to really sit down with all of my folks and explain to them, here's why this is so important. Here's why our services are needed right now to help move this incident along through the process and begin the recovery and healing processes. You know, this is, this is going to be hard work. You know, it's hot. You know, one October, it was still in the high 90s and sunny out here. So the crime scene was extremely hot. That's not exactly good in an area where there were biohazards all around and it was, it was an uncomfortable place to be. And some of my folks, you know, everybody was agreeable. I didn't force anyone to help. I only took volunteers, but to everybody's credit, everybody volunteered. But I did have a few that it was just what the enormity of what had occurred on that site was difficult for them to comprehend. And so I didn't want to exclude them from helping. I had to find other ways for them to help. I could imagine that many of those on your staff might have known some of the people that had attended the concert. So one of the analysts that was assigned to my division, their daughter was at the concert and she was in the first row at the stage when Jason Aldean was performing and the person right next to her was shot and killed. So that happened. I didn't know that until So the incident happened on a Sunday night. Sometime on Monday, you know, I found out that one of my staff had had a daughter that was there. And her daughter was fine, but the analyst and her husband were totally freaked out because they had a very hard time communicating with their daughter and getting to a place where they could pick her up because they lived in a completely different part of town. You know, the daughter didn't really know where she was. And it was quite a traumatic process for that family. And to that mom's credit, she was with us processing that crime scene every day for six and a half days. And she was proud to do that. Essentially, the way that it worked is, is as each grid was completed by evidence response team folks, we went in and started picking up, categorizing, cataloging 
and decontaminating is necessary, the personal effects that were left behind. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of personal effects when it was uh, done. We didn't have any resources available to us to transport this equipment. We relied on relationships that we had with one of the casinos where they loaned us a box truck that we were able to use to transport the personal effects to the Family Assistance Center. We organized the Family Assistance Center in the quadrants that ERT For example, Quadrant A contained the concert goers or victims or their family members would hopefully have an idea what part of the concert venue their loved one was in or that they were in when the shooting started. And so we were able to keep the uh, personal effects basically together in relation to those quadrants to make it easier for people to recover their stuff. You know, we worked with cart people, you know, to get into cell phones to identify who they belong to. And, you know, then law enforcement and or victim witness folks were reaching out to those people to let them know that we had their phone or their wallet and their purse and whatever it was. And by the time that we had finished recovering all this stuff, I think we had about a dozen quadrants in this from this venue and areas within the Las Vegas Convention Center set up to where as people would start to come down, you know, they would be escorted by victim advocates and they would try their best to determine, you know, what part of the concert venue they were in or their loved one was in. And it facilitated in a timely manner, you know, a lot of these personal effects being recovered. You dropped another acronym. CART. Uh CART. I'm sorry. So CART is the computer analysis response team. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they're the uh, computer forensic people that, you know, can deal with electronic and digital devices, you know, from a criminal standpoint is what they normally do. But in this particular instance, I mean, we even had cell phones ringing at the crime scene when we were trying to pick them up. That's kind of weird, right? So anyway, we were able to to do all those things. And it took us, like I said, a little over six days to complete that. And, you know, we were maybe a day and a half behind ERT when they finished the forensic processing of the crime scene. Did you have any contact with any of the victims or any of the victims' families? So one of the things that happened because of my position as the chief within the state system, I had several leaders within my office, but also other offices within the state reach out to me because they had a family member that they couldn't account for. I got four of those calls and sadly three of the four resulted in their family member was one of the victims who died. The fourth call involved a victim who was shot, was in a critical condition in ICU. I think the timing was such that people who were involved in making notifications to next of kin just had not gotten to that person yet. And so that was, was really sad, you know, that I had to get back to some of these contacts and provide them with number and contact information to the coroner's office because that's where they needed to go. We should take a minute to acknowledge all of the victims, not just the victims that were killed or shot, but their extended family who also suffered from the results of of this incident. I mean, it was a horrifying thing to watch on TV. I just can't imagine what it was like to actually be there and see it in person. And you did. I'm happy that I was able to help. You know, one of the other things that was necessary, and here's where relationships and everything come together again, at the state level, People get mad at me probably for saying this, but here in Nevada, employee assistant program resources are terrible. They're terrible when you compare them to the EAP or employee assistance program resources that are available to federal employees. Because we provided, my staff provided the assistance that that we did, victim services and the FBI provided EAP 
services to all my staff. They set up a series of meetings and kind of debriefings, you know, that were done at the small group level and some were done at the individual level. And then if additional, you know, counseling or services were needed, even after everybody went home and life turned back to, to normal, those counseling services were still provided to some of my staff members free of charge to help them process and accept, you know, what they had, they had gone through. And I thought that was phenomenal that the powers to be on the federal level were willing and actually followed through with providing those services to my staff. This is a different kind of of uh, podcast, you know, because I was not involved in the actual investigation of this particular incident. But I think there's uh, several lessons that are key for leaders to know and appreciate. In the FBI, I mean, we always talk about how important relationships are. And, you know, that's with your coworkers on the squads or in the division that you're assigned to, you know, all the way out to your, your liaison relationships and your task force officer partners. But even more importantly than the relationships, that word relationships is trust. Those relationships really don't get you anything unless trust is built into that. And that trust has to be a two-way street, you know. So in this particular instance, because my long-term relationship with the sheriff and the undersheriff and a number of the assistant sheriffs that were involved, as well as the FBI, I think that it was an important factor that, hey, they knew that the mission that we addressed regarding the personal effects was a critical mission that needed to be done, but they trusted me to lead my folks and get it done and allow them to focus on other things that frankly might be more important at this moment than this mission. But it sped up the entire process. So the, the trust factor is, is huge. You know, collaboration, you know, in the FBI, we're used to multi-jurisdictional lines that we have to work within and around you know, in everyday life. I mean, particularly if you're a supervisor or a leader in some other capacity, you find yourself dealing with those all the time. It's important that you understand what those roles are, but it's also important that you understand at some point you might be in a job where you do not have a dog in the fight. You do not have a jurisdictional lane in which to help, but there are other opportunities and you need to be aware of that and your understanding of those multi-jurisdictional lines or lanes will help open up a gap or an area where you can assist in a very meaningful and productive way. And then finally, this is another buzzword that's used all the time. And this is something that I think in general around the FBI, people do extremely well thinking outside the box. There's no playbook for this in the role that I had or the mission that my team and I did in order to support and help with this event. You have to be creative. I mean, one of the things that's really neat about our careers in the FBI, creativity is something that is is used all the time. It doesn't matter it, what kind of investigation it is. It can involve undercover operations or ruse operations. It's prevalent in SWAT operations and everyday life and our investigative mission as FBI agents. But when you get into state and local law enforcement, it's not uncommon for them to really be very regimented and this is my lane and I'm sticking in that lane and nothing outside my lane is my word. And they don't worry about it. That's fine if that's how they want to be, but that's not what's going to help move a recovery process or a healing process forward following a major event like this. And it goes back even still to understanding those jurisdictional lanes or boundaries But it also helps when you understand the resources that are brought to bear, the totality of the resources that are brought to bear to deal with a particular incident. That further gives you information and a sense of where a gap might be that is significant. 
open the door for you to be able to do what you want to do. And in this case, just help, even though it was totally in a supporting role. So at the end of the day, I'm very proud of my team. I'm very proud of how our city dealt with this. Clearly, I'm not in a position to go into it. I'm sure that there were all kinds of issues that did not impact me and my team directly, but everything got done. And, you know, the result of the investigation, et cetera, was what it was. And I think it surprised everybody. What's been reported open source, I think it truly was the stars lined up. And this is one of those worst case scenarios for people in the uh, terrorism world. Someone with no criminal record, connected to no one, flew completely under the radar and committed one of the most vile and heinous acts imaginable. Has it been made public, as far as you're aware, of his motivation, his his purpose? So my understanding of his purpose is this. Apparently, his father was a bank robber. He wanted to outdo his father. Reputation. I'd say he did that. It's just evil what happened. But, you know, that is... That right there is one of those factors that just has resonated with me, you know, since this, this whole incident. Really? You know, you're, you're trying to out bad your father. <laughs> you know, how many people can I hurt or victimize or kill? I mean, it's just, it's just unthinkable. But in this day and age, I don't think any of us would be surprised by anybody's motivation that would commit such a, such an act. Well, I know there are going to be many people listening that would like to have more information about this Las Vegas mass shooting. And I will have links to newspaper articles and news reports that you provided to me. I'll have those links in the show notes of this episode. I will also link to your article in LinkedIn which was called A Former FBI Agent's Biggest Lesson Learned from the Las Vegas mass shooting incident. And I promise two things, to hopefully one day get somebody on the show that was the case agent or somebody who managed the investigative side of this Las Vegas uh, mass shooting. I also hope to have somebody maybe on from Victim Services to talk about the services that they provide to augment investigations. Now, that would be really nice. So this episode is kind of different because we're not talking about a case that an FBI agent was the case agent for. You know, we're talking about something that a retired agent, you, were able to utilize your years of training and experience. And as the host and producer of the show, I think I made a good choice in in making an exception and having you on. So I I really want to thank you for giving everyone an insight of what it's like to be on the outside when a quote unquote career making incident occurs and you're no longer in the FBI. So thank you so much, Rod, for doing that for us. I hope the lessons benefits others that are still on duty with the FBI, them and their careers. So we are at the part of the interview where we find out a little bit more about you. When did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? So I joined the FBI in July of 1995. I am the son of a retired career long FBI agent. And ever since I was a little kid, you know, I was very interested in becoming an agent someday. And when I went to college, my intention was to get an accounting degree and get into the FBI as soon as I could. But accounting and I didn't get along. I decided that my option number two, which was another love of mine, I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a soldier, went through ROTC and then spent 11 and a half years as an infantry officer in the army. The last few years I was posted overseas and I did not have an opportunity to apply to the bureau because I was overseas. 
And then when I came back to the States, there was a hiring freeze between, I don't know, roughly 91 through 90, late 94. I had finished my master's degree in December of 94 and just decided that I'm going to walk into the FBI office here in Las Vegas because that's where I was assigned in my last Army assignment. And sure enough, I sat down with the applicant coordinator and took a test two weeks later. And six months after that, I was at the academy. It went fast. I was lucky in that respect. I got out of the Army only because I had the opportunity to be an agent. Had I not had the opportunity to be an agent, I never would have probably left the Army. I loved my military service and I loved my career in the FBI. As I was eligible to retire from the Bureau, the Attorney General at the time, his staff had found me. I didn't know him. I didn't know any of his staff. They found me and talked to me about being the Chief of Investigations for the Nevada Attorney General's office. And and I had hoped that my post-FBI service would be in a manner that benefited the greater good. And I decided to take a chance on it and retired and went to work for the state as the chief. And I really enjoyed that. It was great. Decided about a year ago now that I wanted to go out on my own. I was a political appointee and that job had a shelf life, you know, the day I said yes. But I wanted to go out on my own in the private sector. COVID hit about the same time. So I'm trying to figure out what my next role will be. And it will either be within my consulting business, RDS Consulting, or it will be some other role in the private sector. I'm excited to see what happens. I can be found on LinkedIn just by searching uh, Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D, parents Rod, close parents Swanson. You know, my, my profile will come up. This has been great. I hope that people listening, you know, especially in law enforcement, especially those before they retire, are able to get a lot out of this. But in case we haven't covered everything that you wanted to say, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Jerry, to talk about this, uh, this incident. I'm extremely proud that my team and I were able to contribute at the level that we did, especially given that we didn't have a dog in the fight. I hope this is useful to others. I'm honored that you thought this was worthy to include as one of your podcasts. Thank you. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com in the show notes for this episode, you'll find a photo of Rod Swanson. There are several photos from the Las Vegas mass shooting, links to photo galleries and an ABC documentary and lots of news articles about this case, as well as more information, including a PDF brochure about the FBI's Victim Services and Assistance Program. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books, and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series, features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.